We are ready for our third speaker. Um, it's now time for me to introduce uh, Dr. Madeline George, Public Health Research Analyst at RTI International in North Carolina. So good morning, Madeline. Your research includes adolescents' mental health, risk-taking, relationships and digital technology use and how the frequency and content on social media relates to offline behaviours and well-being. So uh, welcome, Madeline. Uh, please, the screen is yours. Thank you so much. Um, and I wanted to say thanks to everybody for coming. Um, I was having a little issues with my with my uh, time zone change, but I'm here now. Um, You're here now. So take a deep breath and uh, good morning. And let's see your presentation. <laughs> yeah, hold on. Let me just share my screen. Of course. Excellent. We can see it good now. Okay. Perfect. Great. Um, so yeah, today I'll be talking a little bit about social media use and adolescent well-being. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. So even before COVID, there was a lot of discussion about adolescents' mental health and well-being. And over the past decade, there has been increases in adolescent symptoms of depression and other symptoms. So this worrying trend, people have gotten concerned over it, and we can see that there's been this worldwide increase in loneliness. Um, although when you look at the graph, you actually see it's only a small, about 0.2 point increase. So we see this graph, and we also can look at on the second graph, we can see a small increase over the pandemic period that we're seeing these specific changes in loneliness and poor mental health. And a lot of people are asking and gotten concerned, what's causing this? And increasingly we're seeing in the media that people are saying it's screen time, it's social media. But what does the research actually show? Um, so in the media, we can see these headlines. Uh, we see that they uh, people are saying that it's specifically social media that's causing an increase in depression and loneliness. But when you actually uh, look at the different um, uh, trends, you can see that it sounds very similar to other trends that have happened in the past. So if you look at this uh, lower left, uh, lower right hand um, section, you can see that people were saying the same things in the 1890s about technology. And the new form of technology at that point was books, dime store novels. Uh, people were reading, where kids were reading these fictional novels like Sherlock Holmes, Dracula, all of that stuff. And they were getting into their own world. And uh, people were blaming that on them not being present and not being fully invested in their real lives. Um, so it, th is this really a new phenomenon or is this just another form of tech panic? Our parents just concerned for possibly nothing. Um, as Douglas Adams said, anything that is in the world when you're born is just a natural part of the way the world works. Anything that's invented between when you're 15 and 35 is new, exciting, and revolutionary. And anything that's invented after you're 35 is against the natural order of things. The media will soon be run by people who grew up with iPhones. So, Maybe it's just another tech panic, but let's dig into the science and see, is social media, is screen time, is that different for some reason for adolescents in this day and age? So when we look at some of the data across people, we can see a few different things. Adolescents who spend more time on technology, on screens, they report lower well-being, greater mental health symptoms, they sleep fewer hours in the night, they report more chaos at home and more problems with parents related to their technology usage. And we see that there's these general adolescents who report more tech use generally have more problems with tech. And this um, is, uh, and here's a graph you can see that as adolescents use tech, there's a little bump in well-being, and then the more that they use it, increasing number of hours is related to poor well-being. But wait, 
let's consider a few things. First, these studies that we are looking at are all looking at small effect sizes. So when we say technology use is related to well-being, these graphs often find correlations of about 0 0.05 and at most 0 0.10. So what that looks like when you're trying to describe an overlap is this tiny little area that covers technology usage and well-being. So the overlap is only is less than a percentage point. So there's not actually a whole lot that technology is telling us about well-being if you think about it in that respect. If you also if you also think about it in terms of effect sizes, you can look you can put it into the context of what else is related to teens' well-being. In this graph, um, and these are both pulled from Orban, um, Amy Orban and, and Andy Shabilsky, who have done amazing work on this topic. Um, and if you look at this graph and you see what else is related to adolescent well-being, you can see that uh, technology usage is there's a larger effect size for glasses as compared to technology usage. So perhaps my glasses are causing me to have more depression than my technology usage. Obviously, I don't think research are saying that, but you need to put this into the context of there are a lot of things that could be related to well-being and what is the effect size and it, are there other factors that may be stronger than technology usage. Third, there's all, these studies often also capture these very broad measures of well-being and very broad measures of technology usage. So in looking at tech, they often just ask people, how much time a day do you spend using technology? And these are not good measures. Uh, we're not good at remembering how much time we spend doing something. And so when we ask somebody how much time you spend on an average weekday, these are these could be many different hours, you could be doing many different activities, and they are also probably going to be very uh, broad, so it's not going to capture what you want to capture. You're not capturing any type of specificity. So there's a very big difference between gaming, social media use, watching TV, all of these different types of screen times are all often summed into one measure, and it's not a good measure. Finally, I want to I want to point out a big thing that has been a major hallmark of my research, which is distinguishing between between person and within person processes. So all of these studies mostly look at between people. And what that means is, is let's say I have two people. Participant A uses technology a lot and participant B uses technology a little. And I say, OK, well, Participant A has these characteristics, and so, and they're higher than participant B. So I compare between these two different people. I'm comparing across people. I say, this participant A um, uses technology more and is more depressed as compared to participant B. But this is not necessarily how uh, we can look at causality. We got to look at what's happening within individuals and how this process changes over time. So that's where we get into within people processes. So we can also compare within individuals. So within both participant A and B, we get them both in the study and we compare them over time. So for example, I can compare um, days uh, two and six in participant A, and those are the days that they use more technology do they have more depression on those days compared to themselves on days in which they use less technology? And in this way, we can control for all of these person level effects, their gender, their race, their, a lot of these different factors because they serve as their own control. And importantly, when we look at these effects, they can have very different, uh, they can show very different patterns. So people can be, there can be differences between people and there can be differences within people and these can be very different. So let's explain. When in the studies that I explained before, we saw that adolescents who use more tech had higher mental health symptoms. But when you look at adolescents within themselves on days in which they use more technology, there was no difference in the mental health symptoms that they reported on those days. 
There was no difference in the amount of sleep that they reported. And there was no difference in the amount of positive offline uh, interaction with their parents. So looking within individuals, we don't see the same traits or same problems as we maybe see between individuals. And we can explain this a bit with theory. So typically the theory goes that as adolescents are using technology, they're displacing time spent on social activities that they should be interacting with other individuals. Um, so as they spend more time on screens, they're not spending time with friends or with parents or interacting um, in these normal social activities. And so this is what people have suggested and there seems to be these trends. However, this is a within person process. So th this is saying that um, there should be causality on these different days. However, if we think about this in a different way, if we think about this as a between person process, the adolescents who are lacking social skills or who have more problems in their everyday lives may be interacting online differently and behaving online differently, then we can start to see that maybe it's a between person process. So adolescents who lack the social skills may spend more time online or may interact differently online to compensate for those offline problems. And now we're placing the blame not on technology, but on other factors that may be important for their mental health. And we're placing the technology as a symptom of what is already happening in their offline lives. And this hypothesis fits better with at least the research that I've conducted and other, others that have conducted that are doing more longitudinal or intensive work. So what should we be concerned about? Uh, instead of thinking about the amount of time adolescents spend on social media or the amount of their technologies in general, perhaps we need to think about who is having um, more problems. So in fitting with, these, with this hypothesis, think about who is the teen? What is the characteristics of that teen? What are they already struggling with? What are the offline predictors that may lead to greater online problems? Um, what are they doing online? And when are they online? So in thinking about who, um, uh, we've done some research to look at which are the adolescents who may experience more technology impairment or spill over from offline to online problems or vice versa. And we found that adolescents who come from more disadvantaged or low income backgrounds tend to report that they have greater issues online. They experience more bullying online and they experience um, more uh, problems in dealing with disconnection from offline environments. Um, and so this may be replicating offline vulnerabilities and offline problems that they're already and, and offline disadvantages that they're already experiencing. So we already know that maybe we should be focused on teens who need more assistance and not, it's not necessarily bad for everyone, but for some teens, there may be greater risks involved. Next. Thinking about what? It's not just screen time is one thing. Um, just as adolescents are not a monolith, social media use is not one activity. So instead, thinking about what adolescents are doing online and how they interact with that environment and how that interacts with their personality. So this is an experiment that was um, led by Caitlin Burnell and she, um, and we, what we did was, is we had uh, a young adults go into the lab. They would either look at their own profile for 10 minutes. They would look at an assigned acquaintances profile for 10 minutes, or they would look at an influencers page for 10 minutes. And we looked at their um, well-being and their affect before and after. And what you can see is, is that for those who looked at their own page, they actually, um, the, this first bar, uh, they actually felt a little bit better after looking at their own page. Um, this was a, a somewhat enjoyable activity. They maybe reminisced about their um, good posts. However, if they looked at an influencer's 
or at an acquaintance's profile, they saw this slight dip in well-being, um, especially in greater feelings of envy and jealousy. And this points to the fact that they might be socially comparing themselves to others, as these effects were only found and pronounced higher for those who had, who had a tendency to compare themselves and who had the highest levels of FOMO. So it matters both what you're doing, are you, um, what are you looking at, and who you are. Are you somebody who will see these things and compare yourself to them? And finally, thinking about when social, when adolescents are using technology. Um, it, perhaps even though they don't, they sleep just the same amount of time, is it disrupting them at night? Are they using it during the day while they should be in school? Um, what, are, what, are their, what are they doing on their devices and when? So I'd like to close with the fact that adolescents are not just using technology. Uh, just because it's new and exciting. They're using it to stay connected with peers. It's really about relationships. Adolescence is a time for changing social roles, developing your identity, and becoming independent. And social media in particular offers a space that I don't think that any other space in their offline lives does. It offers a place where they can be, they can express themselves, explore their identities, and connect with their peers in a way that's relatively unsupervised and open for their own interpretation. So a lot, of, a, a lot of teens will say, it's not the technology I'm addicted to, it's my friends. I go on there because it's a place where I can be myself. Um, so for parents, talk to your kids, model good behavior, engage and mediate. This is, there is no one screen time that's good or bad. It's what works for you and your family. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you. 